All right, guys, welcome back to the Squid Talk Pod. I'm super excited to be here. Jacob Peters, you know, now a good friend of mine. We recently met, but um, absolute stud of a human being. Uh, incredible story. We're doing this at his house, which is a little different. Normally, it's at a studio. So thanks for having us. Uh, once again, excited for you to be here. I guess let's let's just get right into it. The first thing that I want to talk about is just your story, because you have an incredible story. Um, obviously, you're very successful, but there's a much deeper reason for why, right? It's uh, you seem like a man with a cause. So let's hear it. Lucas, I appreciate it, man. I'm uh, excited for you to be here in LA. You know, the, the story starts really with my mom. So God bless her, she's an incredible woman. Um, but she really had to sacrifice a lot, uh, you know, to, to make me the, the person I am. So when I grew up, I didn't really have like, you know, the same type of experience that a lot of my friends did because dad was in the military. So moved around a lot and, you know, he was traveling. He spent a lot of time in South Korea and we were stuck here in the States with the family. Um, but my mom was unfortunately stuck in bed for a lot of her life. So she had this disease called chronic cluster headaches. Have you heard of it before? I think so. Yeah. It's, it's basically crazy, like, painful, crazy, painful headaches. All cr the time. Crazy, painful. It's basically like a rare form of migraine, you know? Yeah. And like literally the, the way they describe the pain is it's like, you're sticking like a spear through your eyeball. And before the early 1900s, when people invented morphine, which is like the strongest painkiller, you know, uh, they would just like commit suicide when they had this condition. So it's, it's pretty gnarly. Yeah. Yeah. And she was basically dealing with this, you know, like four or five days a week, you know, she couldn't really hold down a job. It was really tough. So anyway, she finally got hooked up with some really good doctors or so we thought were really good uh, over at Johnson. Yeah. Hopkins. They drain your blood. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're going to get rid of the blood and then you'll be better. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, basically the only thing they could do for her was give her like painkillers. They were just like band-aid solutioning her problem, right? They weren't really trying to dig in and understand, okay, well, what actually could be causing, you know, this super terrible pain and this like, you know, neurological disease. So anyway, that's, you know, her life basically, right? She has to take these painkillers four or five times a week and is just like stuck in bed. And I just get curious, you know, as like a teenager, like this is maybe 15 years ago now. So when I was, when I was like 13 and start Googling, like what are cluster headaches? How do they work? And I discovered all of these internet forums where people were basically like biohacking their symptoms, right? Like this was, you know, well before the, 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 you know, the Andrew Huberman era, right? Before like people were even aware of this stuff, right? Yeah. And, you know, they were like measuring different genes, getting a read on different genes, like measuring their blood levels for different bodily processes, like checking their vitamin levels and, you know, changing what they were eating and like removing different like toxins from their environment, like perfumes, which could like dilate blood vessels in your head. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. So we started implementing a lot of this with my mom and actually made a lot of progress with her mm -hmm. condition that like her doctors were effectively like woefully, you know, unaware of or like, you know, ill-equipped to, to be able yeah. to do. So that was sort of like the first like early, you know, light bulb moment for me when I realized that the healthcare system might not necessarily be on our side. Fast forward, I got into tech. So started a, started a, a software company when I was in my early twenties and this is after college. Did this, you go to college? I, I went to college. Yeah. I did a few years at university of Virginia. Okay. Nice. Down South. Yeah. Yeah. Did you feel at place there? Or was it like, I, I want to be an entrepreneur? I I, absolutely not. And you know, the weird thing is like, I don't, I never actually felt like I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Hmm. It was almost like I, all I knew was that like, whatever I was doing, I did not feel aligned. Yeah. Right. So I, I didn't actually know what my calling was. I just knew that there was like a gross, misalignment. And I think that most people ignore this type of feeling, right? Or they're not even aware that they have this type of feeling. Like I'd venture to say like most of us are living in gross misalignment, right? With like what our ultimate mission should be with what's like most compatible with like, you know, the way our brains work with what we ultimately should be doing and spending our time, like what's ultimately best for the world. So I think a lot about this idea of just like being in general alignment. So for whatever reason, I, I was deeply unfulfilled not the happy. And I just was, was searching for something. And, and, you know, when I, when I discovered the world of tech and the world of entrepreneurship, things started to fall in place. Nice. Were you always kind of a tech whiz or was that like a very foreign, very new field? Cause it's intimidating. Tech is very intimidating, right? It's, it's intimidating. Have you always been in the books since you were a kid or was it? 
I kind of grew up on the internet. Okay. You know, like, yeah. and I mean, it was partly inspired by like all this, you know, researching and these yeah. like forum rabbit holes I, I found myself in with, with my mom. But yeah, you know, when you just spend a lot of time, you get more and more comfortable with it. And actually like the, the, the tech company I started was not like my first business. The, you know, one of my, my early businesses was actually a, uh, like I got into some like dark web stuff with like fake IDs and, you know, I won't go to, I won't go too deep into that. Um, I sold alcohol in college. Yeah. And Viagra. Yeah. We all got to do what we got to do to get by. Yeah. <laughs> got to do what you got to yeah, do. I funded my, my startup. Wow. Well, now I run a company that sells Viagra online. So, yeah. Oh, there you go. I hit you up. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so entrepreneur since a very young age, um, you start and build multiple companies with the software company. Was that a pretty big exit? Like you don't have to say the number, but was that like a quite a sizable check for a, what you, were you 24 at that point? Yeah, it, I'm 25. So um, it was kind of, you know, you know, the Drake lyric, 25 sitting on 25 mil. Like uh, I used to sing that a lot. I'll, nice. I'll leave, I'll leave really? it at that. Really, 25 or 25? <laughs> That's wild. Even anywhere close to that, it's like actually just very, you can't even comprehend that for most people like that. that being 60 with that much money is, seems awesome, right? It seems very foreign to a lot of people. I'm curious, I'm assuming like there wasn't much downtime or did you kind of just go on a crazy party spree? I, were you living in LA at that point? I, right around that time I had just moved to LA and it was during the pandemic. So there, there wasn't even oh, any parties. So you don't even man. get to use it. There's no parties. That's um, crazy. But then we did something even crazier. Um, so this was my next business yeah. after the software company. It was called Launch House. Mm -hmm. And the idea there was let's create a incubator and community for other entrepreneurs because when i was building my first my first business the, the tech platform it was like super lonely yeah I you know i i um i i i you know like didn't really have any like other entrepreneur friends right it was just me and my business partner and we were actually interestingly enough we decided to be like a fully remote and distributed company like well before the pandemic we started this a few years before so you know we didn't really have like in-person community there was no office the company was distributed. Like my, my form of community was my zoom, you know, chat with the team and Slack. And it just, it, it just, I, I never really felt like, you know, fulfilled. And like, I had the same sense of, you know, camaraderie yeah. and, and community. So, um, you know, after going through that journey, although, you know, I, I had like a, a great personal outcome, I wanted so much more. So, and I, and I would basically never wanted another entrepreneur to have to like build, you know, a company in the same way I did where like they didn't feel like, you know, they had other people to turn to because building something really, really big and impactful, it's, it's, it's really freaking hard. Like yeah. really, 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 really hard. You basically get punched in the face, you know, day in and day out. And like, that's your job description. Effectively. Can you, can you explain that a little? Because I mean, one of my whole goals with the Squid Talk podcast is to like, obviously touch on incredible success, success stories. But there's two parts to it. Like, number one, it's inspiring anybody out there to go and start a business of their own. Anyone who's been intimidated by it, maybe give them like that that initial push they need to get out there and start. But also, like, kind of shed a light on how tough it is, right? So can you explain, like, exactly what does it take? What did you have to sacrifice? Did you lock yourself in a room for two years? Like, what was the, what was the building of the first, the tech company like? So it's, I say it's really hard to do these things, but like, it's also really hard to, you know, be broke or like, sure. you know, to yeah. like not have your shit together. Yeah. Um, so like life is just hard, right? Like, n n you know, no, no matter which way you cut it. So you might as well choose to do something that ultimately like can better the world, you know, and better yourself and put you on a journey to, you know, some form of like financial yeah. sustainability. So yeah, I think that's just the, the way I'll, the, the way I'll caveat it. But when it comes to like, you know, the, the reasons why it's hard, I mean, it's just all about solving problems. Like there's, there's never a time where, you know, things are just coasting and everything's perfect. Like, it's just, if you if you think about what a business is from, I always think back to things like very mathematically, right? Like I'm a pretty like math driven guy. Yeah. And, you know, when you build a product, you're, and, you know, like Steve Jobs always says similar things. He's basically like, like think about the MacBook, right? Like you're literally mm -hmm. stitching together like thousands or tens of thousands of different components, right? Like different software packages all the way to like different hardware bits and pieces from all over the world, from all these different suppliers. And you're like, you know, packaging it together into like this beautiful machine, right? Like yeah. you're just, you're combining things. So anytime you have that many variables in like a business equation, right? Or like a product, like it's just like 
statistically very likely that like things are going to go wrong, right? Mm -hmm. A supplier is going to be late. A part's going to break. Something's not going to work the way you thought it was going to work. Um, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a huge space that you're operating in. Um, so anytime like you're doing that, it just, you're very likely to run into to problems and like sure. nothing ever goes the way you think it's, you think it's going to go. So you kind of just have to realize like, that's what you're signing up for, right? Like that's how this stuff, this yeah. stuff works. It's, and you have to be excited by it and you have to almost like retrain your brain to like, love getting punched in the face, right? Well, it's and fun. It, Challenge it's, is fun. And I think, um, I don't know. I think if you look at it like a video game, right? Everyone plays video games. Everyone did when they were a kid. Video games are hard, right? You have to sit there and, and do this thing for eight hours a day if you want to, you know, be in the top 1%, right? And you have to, you know, do all these challenges. But it's also really fun at the same time. Like, I think people look at a video game as a, just a distraction. But the, the reality is, like, you're sitting there and you're thinking on how to play this video game and it's fun at the same time right and building a business i think is the same thing you just have to you have to look at building a business like a video game right it is just one challenge after the other and there's the ultimate reward at the end of it but i don't know i think this is a great question i wanted to ask actually do you think some people are just built for that like some people are just born entrepreneurs some people are born to be successful or is it something that like you if you're lucky you kind of come across that addictive feeling early on and then you just keep on on building off of that do you understand what i'm saying it's a great question there's there's no one size fits all yeah formula like i, I would never want to say like some people are bored with it and then discourage mm -hmm. someone you know i mean th i will say though that like there are certain people that just do have a, an it factor right and like you know it when you got it or like you know it when you see it right like some people just have like a certain magnetic energy right we're just like interesting things attract to them like like a magnet. But then I also know people like that, that have that certain like magnetism and vibration yeah. and energy to them who tell me that like, they didn't used to be like that. Hmm. And they like, you know, friends are like, yeah, he's completely changed and reinvented himself. So that being said, reinvention's possible, right? Like if you feel like you're not super entrepreneurial today or like, you know, things aren't going your way in life or you don't like have this just like, you know, elevated spirituality and confidence to you, because the brain's so neuropl neuroplastic, it's like totally possible to rewrite everything, you know? So there is hope. There is hope. For someone out there who hasn't even started I, yet. I right? think They're so. 25 uh, years old or 30 years old. That's good. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you, uh, you said that. Cause I want to believe it, man. Like I was an anxious kid, yeah. you know? I, I definitely like did not feel super confident. I did not operate from a place of like abundance. Hmm. You know, I operated from a place of, of scarcity and anxiety. And it was just, it wasn't the right like, you know, operating manual for life. Yeah. Okay. Well then, you know, obviously you've scaled and built multiple companies, sold them, made a lot of money, but you're still going. Now you're working on this company, superpower, which we'll get into a little bit later, but I want to give like the full backstory on you before we get there. Cause I think it's important with what you just said, right. About how some people have a spark. Some people find it later. Some people never find it. What do you think is your superpower? What, what's been the thing for you that has allowed you to be so successful at a young age that's allowing you to keep on growing mm -hmm. as a person, as an entrepreneur? What do you think of that? Well, here's the interesting thing. You know, I always say someone's superpower can be also a super weakness. So like, it, it, if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Like again, going back to like this idea of math, right? Like if you dial up one knob, as far as, you know, you're like, you know, you dial a knob up to 10, yeah. just because, you know, our, everything's finite, um, you know, our brain capacity is finite. Like you might be dialing another knob down to one, you know, like mm -hmm. you, you, you get really, really good at one thing, but then maybe you're not as good. You really train your biceps hard, but then you forget to do calves, you know, cause yeah. you only have a certain amount of time in the gym, you know? Um, so like that basically means that what you're really, really good at can also be like, you know, a downside in, in, in some sense. So, are you a workaholic? Is that kind of what you're trying to get at? Like there were other parts of your life that had to suffer because building and, and, and growth and entrepreneurship was like the main focus. That definitely happened. So I totally disregarded my health. Hmm. So, uh, you know, I'll reveal my superpower in a second, but maybe to jump onto sure. this point. Yeah. I mean, like building a company because it's so hard and it requires so many sacrifices. Like, you know, I always say relationships, business or health, like pick two, you know, it's, it really is hard to do it all. Yeah. It's really, really hard. And it's, I think it's possible to pick all three, but you have to go into it with like 
a certain intention and a certain knowledge of like how the body works, right? Like what is a good like routine to take care of yourself and optimize your body across all dimensions? What is a healthy way, you know, to like keep up relationships going strong, even when like you yeah. might not be spending as much time, right? What is like a, a, a way to like build a business in like a high leverage manner where like you're spending your time very effectively and productively so that you don't like make dumb mistakes that, you know, set you back or like, you know, prevent you from moving as fast as you want. So it's like better, it's possible to get better at all these things, but like, if you don't actually know a lot of like the written playbooks and like the best practices, you're going to struggle trying to like find balance among those three things. So the mistake I made early in my company building journey, even though like, you know, you could say it worked out in some senses from a financial standpoint, the cost had to come from somewhere. And in my case, it came from, it came from my body. Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit? Like, do you just completely disregard, like, just, do you mean in terms of, in what way did you disregard your health? I definitely didn't sleep well for years. Yeah. So a few problems, like, and I'm sure everyone listening would be like, you know, pretty familiar with yeah. some of the, like, number one, I just wasn't sleeping right. So I would stay up super late. I would sleep in some nights I'd, you know, go to bed early. So basically I didn't have like a balanced circadian rhythm, right? Mm -hmm. I was not going to bed and waking up at the exact same time, which, you know, the science now is pretty clear. That is like the optimal way to live life because that's effectively how like our cells evolved, right? Like we were in environments where the sun came up, the sun went down. We basically rose and fell with like the, you know, natural light in the environment. We didn't have yeah. screens. We didn't have, you know, like worldly to do's to keep us, awake and like video games to sacrifice sleep with it just didn't exist right so like my circadian rhythm or was your totally employee is hitting you up saying there's a fire yeah on floor three exactly it must, it must be pretty hard to i mean I, I experience this all the time i have a business and like i'll go to bed and be stressing about something or maybe even i'll go to bed and be really excited about something and it's hard to sleep it's it's really hard to go to bed at the same time every single night when there's shit that has to be done and you as the one in control you as the one with the major decision-making power have to like be ready at all times it's it's you know it's it's tough yeah so so even if like you know you maybe get the circadian rhythm thing dialed and you're going to bed and sleeping at normal hours yeah like it's you might wake up in the middle of the night and think shit why didn't i do that thing or mm -hmm. like you know you have a business problem that's like just like ruminating that you're ruminating on like that's still a problem for like, sure that, that doesn't go away um some tactics i found are like surrendering before bed so like I'll, I'll either journal where i write down everything in my brain so then i'm like okay it's out of my head and it's on paper mm -hmm. i can worry about it tomorrow let's get a peaceful sleep or i just tell myself like i surrender like i surrender to all the stress i surrender just get it out of my brain effectively right where i kind of like whisper this you know like to myself verbally like you know i i just i kind of flush it out of my system mentally yeah. in a sense so that so that works for me but i wasn't taking care of my sleep just to bring it back um and I was like working up till the second I went to sleep. So like if you use blue light, you know, from your screens before bed, again, all this stuff is like so crystal clear, base reality, like provable empirical facts, right? It's been well-researched, well-studied. There's a lot of analyses and stuff like it totally fucks your sleep. So I was doing that. I was also like eating right before bed. Sometimes I'd even work out before bed thinking I was healthy, but apparently that raises your heart rate tremendously, which like makes you have a lot less restful of a sleep. Um, so I was doing all the wrong things and I had no idea, right? So, so that was like one big big problem. The second big problem is I my, did not listen to my body. My body was telling me something and I totally ignored it. So I had like some really weird like gut symptoms, hmm. right? Like I'd eat eggs in the morning and next thing I know, like I'd get this like brain fog. Have you ever felt brain fog before? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. but I never, I guess I never, it's hard to know when it's brain fog versus being tired or yeah, but I, I know what you mean. So that's the thing. Like it, most of us just have like no idea what like the state of our body is yeah. or like what our body's trying to tell us. Yeah. So I've gotten really into this concept called interoceptive awareness, mm -hmm. which means basically being hyper aware and like in tune with the state of your body and the signals that your body is, is telling you and what that means. So like if you have brain fog as an example, um, usually it's actually inflammation driven. It's literally like the brain slightly inflamed, which means like, you know, your immune systems are, uh, you know, reacting. Um, and it's because of like something you ate or like because of like the status of your gut. So like, um, sometimes food can basically like, if your gut isn't very healthy and very strong, like your you want your gut wall, like that protects your stomach from the rest of your body to be strong. If it's not yeah. that strong and it's kind of weak, like literally like particles and bacteria and food and stuff can like literally leak from your stomach into the rest of your bloodstream. And then that like finds its way to the brain and inflammation. So you're saying that if I drink Diet Coke, and I eat Cheetos and cake all day. 
it's going to affect everything else in my life. Unequivocally. There you go. <laughs> you guys heard it. I, I think that's what's crazy. What like a lot of people don't understand is, and this is a lot easier said than done, but like, obviously your health comes first, right? Your, your mental health is directly correlated to your physical health, right? So people who have depression or are anxious or feel foggy, like you said, or are just like simply feeling like they're not doing as much as they can to get ahead in life. Would you not agree that the first thing you should do, or at least one of the first things you can do is, is figure out your physical health, right? Com completely. I, you know, my hot take is the mental health industry is kind of a scam. Yeah. In the sense that most mental challenges or like, you know, feelings of anxiety, depression, laziness, fatigue, this, that, like whatever, you know, lack of inspiration, it's actually downstream of like an upstream biological problem. Yeah. Right. Like if you're not sleeping well, you know, you're probably going to be in a more inflamed state, Watching which is like all the time. Something exactly. Like that. All these things like, you know, I cut out all that stuff and yeah. like you feel infinitely better. Um, so we'll get into this in a sec. But like, you know, uh, because I run this health company now, uh -huh. you know, we, we we test a lot of things in people's blood that traditional yeah. doctors don't normally test. And, um, you know, if you're like watching a lot of porn and you know, it actually changes some of your blood chemistry. Wow. And we see that. Um, but we'll I'll, I'll, I, I won't tease too much okay we'll cool yeah I, yeah I definitely want to get into superpower because i think that's super fascinating and like me personally as an entrepreneur as someone that's trying to be optimal in all areas of my life that 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 fascinates me a lot but before we go there let's talk about launch house real quick um because that that's kind of like what you got known for in a lot of ways right obviously you were very successful already but that's how you became known in like the social media space right so can you explain what launch house was and like you know, I guess we'll start there. Yeah. I mean, it was basically a, I mean, this connects back to like why I moved to LA. Yeah. It was like a, a crazy pandemic era idea. So it was early days of the pandemic and, you know, everyone was stuck in like their, you know, parents' houses or, you know, mm -hmm. in their apartments and like couldn't really leave, socialize. It just, the, the world was locked down. Right? Like sucked. we all remember it. Yeah. It kind of sucked. So I was like, let's make this not suck. And um, there were people who, you know, were, basically make it not suck on social media. Like you had, um, you know, Jake Paul with like his, you know, team 10, like just the hype house. Like there was all these like influencers basically yeah. getting these, you know, content mansions in Beverly Hills and like the LA area and putting a bunch of, you know, creators in a house in one space and going viral on social media, right? All sharing best practices, posting one another, like, you know, making yeah. money. Like it was a thing. Do you everyone's, remember? everyone's cooped up and you have nothing to do but consume. Yeah. You pre produce or consume. So you put all these, it, it, what you did was different because most people put creators together for entertainment. Yeah. You put, I don't want to say creators aren't smart, but you put a lot of really smart, really driven, really ambitious we people. We put in fucking house. nerds in a house. Yeah. And you said, like, oh. but you put nerds in a house and you gave them an opportunity to have a lot of fun and also a lot of resources at hand, right? Because I'm sure there were a lot of investors, people that were like, yep. this is a great idea. Let's give you money. So, like, so basically, I was trying to give other entrepreneurs, the community that I never had yeah, okay. when I was building my business. Right. Yeah. So we, um, we got a mansion in Beverly Hills. We rented Paris Hilton's old estate. It was like a $30 million house in, in, in the Hills. Sick. Yeah. Damn. I would have loved to be in that. I know we don't have it anymore. I know. Um, I'll start the next one. Yeah. We'll start the next one. <laughs> let's do it, man. Um, so yeah, we put like 20 entrepreneurs in this house and we cycle in new entrepreneurs every so often. And we just helped them build their businesses. You know, like I've been fresh off a really, really steep growth trajectory of, you know, building, um, building like a high growth software company. So there was like a lot of learnings to share, a lot of learnings, you know, I discovered from like pitching to investors. My first company we raised like over $70 million for it. That's crazy. Wait, sorry. No, to, <laughs> to, I do want to talk about Launch House, but this is also something I really wanted to ask too. How do you go from never having raised money before to raising $70 million for a company? Well, we didn't start, it's, we didn't raise 70 all at once. You know, the first like, two, the first like 120K was the hardest. Yeah. You know, like we spent nine You're months. the first person to say yes. Exactly. You just need one person to say yes. Okay. Right. But uh, honestly, um, I don't even know if I, you know, believe in like big investor raises and, you know, venture capital as much mm -hmm. as I used to. Like, I actually think honestly it's a bit of propaganda. Like there's venture capital is a very particular type of, you know, it's just like early risky startup financing. It's a very particular type of way of financing a business for a very particular type of business, right? That's like mainly tech and software based and like very high growth potential. 95% of businesses out there 
don't really need that type of cash injection, right? You can basically start, you know, a small services business, a creative agency, a consumer product brand with no money or like a few, you know, five, ten, twenty thousand dollars of savings, or like maybe yeah. even a hundred grand of investment from like some family and friends or something, but like or zero dollars, right? Like I know so many people that have hustled their way from nothing to something like alchemy, right? So like there's a lot of different ways to build a business. So I wouldn't, you know, treat like my situation as dog one. We were basically, you know, building a company that required like very specialized skill sets. You know, we had mm -hmm. to hire like 20 engineers yeah. to build this like, you know, really impress impressive technical feat. So, but yeah, the, 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 the money just doesn't come like that. It, it takes like so much trial and error. I mean, I probably pitched to like, you know, we probably pitched to 200 investors, mm -hmm. you know, over the course of years and years and the first nine months, you know, all we got was no, 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 no. And nine went straight. Nine went straight. See, most, I love that because most people, the first time they get there, no. And it is absolutely inevitable. And every single story I've ever heard, everyone I've had on my podcast, but most people, when they get there first, no, they just stop right there. Right. And oh, it's not for me. Sorry. Well, maybe my business isn't that good. How many no's do you think you got in that nine months before the first yes? At least 50. That's crazy. Yeah. Like, just, you know, and, and the first yes was only $10,000. Yeah. So how so do you, <laughs> what's, do you have any advice on, in terms of perseverance, how do you keep going? Is it just because you believed in the idea so much, you knew that like eventually someone has to say yes, right? So, so there's one common denominator because every business is different. Every yeah. entrepreneur is different, but there is one common denominator that every single large business owner or entrepreneur has followed. And that's limitless self-belief. Mm-hmm. Now you can have limitless self-belief. It's almost like delusion and in a way. It's delusion. It's, yeah. it's, it's like healthy delusion. And you can have that and still fail. But guess what? If you think about the Venn diagrams, like 100% of people that, you know, figure it out, they all had the self-belief. Like it's it's actually, course. because again, take it back to how hard this stuff is. If it's so hard and you don't believe, you're just going to get like, you know, railroaded on the bad days. Yeah. You never meet anyone who's built something impressive that said, I mean, yeah, I, I thought I'd give it a try and then it just worked out. It's like, no, like I knew. I mean, to be fair, I do have a few friends that like bought Bitcoin in 2012. And that's, that, the, that's, not <laughs> that's not like entrepreneurship though. No, that's, I know. Like, <laughs> that's, that's success, sure. But, and, and that's cool. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, that's awesome. I, you know, one of my good friends is tens of millions in crypto, you know? Um, so he's killing it. But like, I, at least he had that term, that self-belief of like, I'm going to do this no matter what. But I think that is what it takes. And... I love I love the word delusion because it's it's thought of as a bad thing, but you need to be so delusional. You need to be so confident in yourself and what you can do, even if it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And then you'll figure it out, right? I, I feel like there is no not figuring it out. And anyone who like is just starting, you you just have to convince yourself somehow that there is no way you can possibly fail if you just do it for long enough. And then eventually it will happen. It might take a year. Might take five years. You might might take two investor meetings. It might take two hundred. So, it, I mean, I it's very inspiring that you were able to do all that at a young age, right? And then, you know, mo like I said at the beginning, most people would get their exit twenty five million at twenty five. Damn, bro, let's move to LA. Let's get a sick house. Let's let's just enjoy the rest of our life, right? And then they waste it and fall off. But I feel like most of the people that are most of the people that have the capability to accomplish something that impressive never just stop right after, right? It's like right on to the next thing. You know what I mean? Is Do you feel like that's pretty accurate in terms of all the successful people you met? Compounding is what I'll say, right? There's a power in compounding. Yeah. When you do things for a really, really long time, you know, it pays off, right? Like you invest in the stock market, you hold it for 30 years. If you wake up with like a really great routine and you spend two to four hours of deep work every single day, like over years and years and years, you know, it's going to pay off. If you have one win and then you roll that win into the next venture and then you have the win and you roll that win into the next venture, all of a sudden, like it's a snowball effect, right? Mm -hmm. It compounds over time. So yeah, I do, I do believe in that philosophy. Nice. Hell yeah. Well, it sounds like it's been working out for you for sure. So, so just to recap, um, you know, interesting, you know, things I had to, to deal with with my mom, right? Yeah. That got me interested in tech and then started the software business, built Launch House. And, you know, the idea there was let's, you know, create community and content and kind of like an influencer mansion for entrepreneurs. Yeah, what was the result of that also, by the way? Yeah, it was... What's, it was, what's the biggest the biggest takeaway from that entire experience? 
the biggest takeaway from that entire experience. Um, it's really hard to control human beings, you know, <laughs> like um, build a business where the people aren't the product. Um, you know, I have friends who like have managed, you know, like really big name, you know, like artists and things, people we'd all know, right? We probably listen to on our Spotify. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you know, it was really inspiring, like building what we did and building these personal brands, but it was also really freaking hard, you know, because yeah. like people are the products, right? So I think, um, you know, in our case, community was the product, which made it really, really challenging. So, um, you know, although we had a lot of successes and we like, you know, we invested in 50 different companies that came through the community and like helped a few thousand founders get their companies off the ground. Few thousand? A few thousand, yeah, That's total. Crazy. Yeah, over, wow. over two years. Um, I will say my big overarching lesson <laughs> is, uh, yeah, being in the people business is, 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 is not something I want to be in for the rest of my life. That's fair. Was it kind of like, being an agent in a way, but on just a massive scale and, and, that's the and thing. in a different industry. Yeah, exactly. And like, you know, we didn't scale, right? was the problem. You yeah. know, like there was only one of me and so many people asking for my time that it was, it was overwhelming. And I'm assuming you were getting equity in all these companies that you were helping. Yeah, we would invest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause why, in why would you connect yeah. everyone and help out if there's nothing in return? Okay. Well, yeah. well, was, was launch house a success or a failure in the end? Uh, you know, I think I didn't end up making that much money from it yeah. personally. I mean, we'll see. I still own like equity positions in a lot of these, you know, these businesses. So mm -hmm. then, and this is the thing with, with investment, like you won't know for seven years. Yeah. So maybe the answer is, I don't know as mm -hmm. far as financial success, um, as far as personal fulfillment unequivocally. Nice. I okay, mean, that's awesome. it changed my life because I got to hear the stories of like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of like really amazing, you know, top 0.1% people that like, you know, decide to go follow their dreams and put it all out on the line. And, and you got that community that you were looking for. I got for that community that I was looking for. So from that standpoint, yeah, it was like the biggest dub ever. Hmm. Oh yeah. I'm glad to hear that. And I feel like, I mean, I know myself when I was in college, I had tons of friends. I was having a ton of fun on paper. Great. Right. But I felt extremely lonely and isolated because I was literally the only person that was starting a business. I was the only person on social media. And now because of social media, I've been able to meet a lot of awesome people like yourself, like the guy who connected us, right? Everyone. Um, and it changes everything, right? It, it, it not only does make you feel, it, it gives you that sense of community, but it also just like completely increases the chance of success, right? Knowing other people who can help you, who can connect you with people who can you know, you can learn from their mistakes. Like every single one of these podcasts, I treat it like, obviously I would love for them to get views and do well, but I treat it as a learning opportunity for me too. So um, I can totally see why that would be impactful, not only on a monetary um, standpoint, hopefully later on over the next couple of years, but just like, yeah, connecting with awesome people, learning a lot. Um, and so doing we, it in a beautiful environment. Yeah, in LA, like a ton of fun. Yeah. I mean, I really, that, it sounds like exciting as hell, we, to we be honest. We that must be fucking sick. We flipped the script on the investment world. So, you know, the last point on Launch House is traditionally when you're like building a company, you know, in the tech world that you want to get really, really large, you have to like go to all the investor offices, right? Mm -hmm. And like here you are like this, you know, lowly founder um, with basically just, you know, um, you know, like an MVP in a dream minimum viable product in a dream and like you're going to you know these investor offices and like you know it's it's like the power dynamic is there yeah. right like you're, you're kind of begging to them for money right like you're the one that's needy um we flipped the script where you know we put these entrepreneurs in this like gorgeous you know amazing mansion <laughs> we had one in new york too so we were operating on both coasts and, and investors had to come to that that's lit yeah, it was it was lit so it definitely helped with with fundraising nice oh yeah. yeah so okay well that's an i mean Number two, right? So the first company does extremely well. Then this, you know, I to me, that sounds awesome, honestly. Like, just in terms of what it gave you. Not everything's about money. Not everything's, um, you know, not everything can be measured by a dollar value. So that, that sounds incredibly valuable, at least in terms of experience, trying something new, moving out to LA. How long ago did that kind of wrap up? And then how long after that did you start the current venture superpower? Yeah, so something else happened while I was building Launch House mm. that led me to Superpower. So it was um, mid-2021, and I got super sick. 
So there's a reason I, you know, alluded to all the the health challenges and the, okay. the fact that I didn't really like take care of myself in the proper way when I was building my companies. So yeah, I found myself in a hospital bed because I, I pushed too hard and my body wasn't cooperating with me. And then what? Do you find yourself there? Is, you know, any, any major revelations? You're like, I need to switch my, where, where my focus is. Can you, can you go into that a little bit? Yeah. Well, what was I it mean, like sitting in the hospital bed where you're like, wow, the, you know, I'm, I'm, I have the money. I, I thought that I was winning, but now like I, it might be over. I mean, how serious was it? It was, it was pretty serious. Yeah. So basically, um, you know, it was kind of like a confluence of factors, right? Like I definitely was not taking care of myself in the right way. Number one, mm -hmm. you know, making this like, you know, what I thought was like an, a good intentional sacrifice, but giving up sleep to push the business forward, but probably not the right decision in retrospect. Um, you know, and then I had these like weird, like gut issues that I was talking about that I couldn't really put my finger on at the time. Cause again, I lacked that, like, you know, being in tuneness with my body and that interoceptive awareness. And then, um, you know, I do the thing that everyone else was doing at the time. Like I get the COVID vaccine and, you know, being in LA, like, you know, um, everyone was getting it and it was just the thing to do. And, um, basically within, you know, a few hours of getting, I was like, something's wrong. Cause I just didn't feel right. And then you're like, you know, you, you get some symptoms, but I was like, no, like something like is really, really wrong. Um, and I ended up that night, um, having to call the ambulance because, uh, it felt like I had drank six cups of coffee. So my heart was like Jesus. beating like out of its chest basically. And I don't drink caffeine. We were talking about this earlier. Like, uh -huh. you know what he was, Lucas was like, what's your morning routine? I'm like, I don't drink coffee, just vibes, yeah. you know? So like, I, I don't know what that's like, you know? And, um, but it felt like I was like, oh shoot, like something's, something's wrong here. You know, have you ever taken like a caffeine pill or something like way too much caffeine? You're like a horny go-go. Yeah. You ever heard of that? No. <laughs> it's like this pill you get at a gas station. It's like my acro like, plus like, like a blue chew. Plus something a whole like Celsius. Like yeah. Wild. So you, you get the COVID vaccine yeah. and then immediately you're like, immediately you're like, something is not right. Right. You get taken to the hospital ambulance. And then they diagnosed me with this thing called myocarditis, hmm. which is inflammation of like the lining and the muscle of your heart. So, you know, we don't really know like exactly like, you know, what kind of like causes this. It's, I think the science is still kind of being figured out. Um, you know, I'm not saying like all vaccines are bad, but like, you know, there were definitely some challenges with the way that, you know, these things were, were rolled out. Like I, I found out after the fact that, you know, from, from some, folks that are kind of insiders in the industry that apparently just because of the way the, 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 the these things were rushed, the quality control led to some vats and batches having like thousand X, the amount of, you know, potency versus others. It was basically just like saline water, right? Like you weren't even getting real vaccine. So who knows what I got, you know, who know? I could have had some, like, I basically think I had some like weird, you know, autoimmune, which is like when your immune system's all overactive and messed mm -hmm. up, you know, process going on in my body beforehand, but there was no like warning around if you have these like, you know, pre existing issues, you shouldn't be a candidate for this. It just didn't really exist. It was very early on in the pandemic. And like, we didn't really know. It was just rushed. They were trying just to rushed. get something out. And I think, I think public, I think public perception played a big role in that. So many people were like, we need it now, now, now. So it makes sense. Yeah. So I, you know, I, um, I find myself in the hospital bed dealing with the heart issues. And then, um, while I'm there, my like stomach starts flaring up. So like, um, I had all these like stomach issues and they're like, you now have Crohn's disease. Have you heard of this? Jesus. No. Like What's that? it's basically, um, a, a condition where like your immune system starts attacking your stomach uh -huh. and like, it's obviously a major organ, right? Like it's literally how we eat, you know, whether you're eating healthy or eating the Cheetos, like it's how your body, you know, breaks down the food chemicals and turns into energy. And like, that was basically all like inflamed and like bleeding on the inside for me. So, and um, you could feel that you're laying there thinking like, did you think at any point, did you think like, this is the end or were you just like, God, I hope I make it through this. Not like, at first, but like, you know, after being there for two months, yeah. And you lose Jesus. 40 pounds and like, you know, it, it was just miserable. Yeah. So I'm like ailing, you know, for months in this hospital bed and I like, can't figure out how to get the inflammation storm under control. They tried all these different like prescription drugs and like these things called biologics with like, which like, you know, uh, kind of like dampen your immune system, but nothing really worked. So I ended up becoming a bit of 
a price tag to the hospital. Mm. And what I mean by that is um, they made over $2 million. Off you? On my situation. That is fucking crazy. Like that's a full seed round, you know, for a startup. Wait, so let's summarize that. COVID vaccine ends up leading to some complications, which is a, at the end of this, you know, two, three months in the hospital is a $2 million bill. $2 million bill. That's fucking crazy. And the reason for that is because they actually decided to perform surgery yeah, um, to take out like part of my stomach. So they like removed like basically my entire colon, which is like, you know, the bottom part of your. Yeah. It's your important. It's important. Need that. Well, apparently you don't because here I am. Oh, you know? Okay. But, there um, you go. but yeah, it was, it was gnarly. So they, and then, you know, the, the reason they, 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 they do all this stuff, like hospitals, they make a lot of money through yeah. surgery, right? Like versus the alternative. So only later on down the line did I realize that there's a different philosophy of medicine, which is basically closer to like what I was doing with my mom early on in life, where you actually get to the root of what a problem is mm -hmm. instead of just band-aid solutions, right? And not only that, but you you look at the body holistically across everything that you're doing, all of your inputs, all of your environmental triggers and stressors and all the things that are happening to you, right? In this case, they were only looking at like my inflammation levels and like my gut. They weren't ask they weren't trying to figure out, hey, like, you know, how stressed out are you? Like what is the state of your nervous system? How's your headspace doing, right? Are you in like a positive mental attitude mindset? What are you eating? Like, what are your nutrient stores? You know, is your body very nourished across like every dimension, every type of nutrient? It's crazy that that's not something that's implemented in, it's the, so in, crazy. The, in the health industry. It's, it's, it's wild. I mean, yeah, we were talking about this before, like for anyone watching or listening, my dad's a doctor um, and he pretty much told me two out of three doctors should not be there, right? And I think, I think, the perception of the word doctor, the word hospital, um, the, the word surgery, like the perception is- Is trust, but- Is complete trust. This person knows what they're doing, right? Or this system knows how to fix me, right? In reality, it's just a couple of people who studied a couple of years longer than you. And I don't wanna like, I don't wanna, you know, well, get rid of the importance of, of the healthcare industry and they will save your life. and many, many circumstances, but they're, they're not perfect. Right. Well, so, so the, the, you know, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the medical profession. Yeah. I work with doctors all day now, you know, with my new, with my new business. And, um, you know, it's, it's very respectful for anyone that mm -hmm. wants to dedicate their life to, to serving humanity and, you know, furthering medicine and practicing medicine. But the reality is, is it's healthcare in America is a business yeah. and it's a big business, a big fucking business. And because these hospitals make a lot of money on surgery, they're literally incentivized to, suggest surgery over anything else right so later on down the line like uh you know about like a year after all this went down or, or like nine months after this went down, i got connected to a different type of doctor who you know practiced like this root cause holistic medicine and she told me that she had seen about a dozen other people with my exact scenario mm -hmm. and um she only lost one colon like she saved the other 11 effectively so she was like 11 for 12. Damn. Yeah. And I mean, can you, was this, was this person, uh, obviously their education was probably a little bit different than the traditional doctor. Did, like what kind of, what kind of medicine is, what did this be called? It's called integrative medicine. You know, okay. it's like you, you do practice MD driven medicine, but like you integrate everything, right? It's, yeah. it's looking at the whole picture. Right. Jeez. So, so it's, you know, integrative longevity, like personalized medicine effectively, right. Which is preventative medicine, you know, whatever name you want to, you want to put on it. But that's like how things really, really should be. And like, you know, she had a protocol for this type of stuff. She's like, here's what we would have done. We would have given you 40 sessions of hyperbaric oxygen, which hyperoxygenate your cells for healing. We would have given you like this stack of supplements and peptides. We would have balanced these nutrients. We would have done this blood test to see if we could figure out what's actually going on. We would have given you these probiotics and these yeah. like you know, antimicrobials to fix the bad bacteria ratios in your colon. And then, um, you know, we would have calmed you down through like some just like meditative best practices and like, you know, getting your headspace right. And, you know, stimulating your vagus nerve, which is this like big nerve in your body that apparently like, you know, relates to like how stressed out you are and stuff. So like all these things, a completely different process. And that probably would have costed 10 grand. So let's just do the math. If we're like, you know, the, the CEO of this hospital system, right? Like $2 million, 10 grand. 
Yeah. But they don't even know that the 10 grand options exist. So yeah. like, who knows, you know, it's a big what if game. And but I'm, like, I'm also, let me ask, I'm assuming that this professional that you saw, I don't want to say is shunned, but I'm assuming that it's not like typically supported. Like if you were to ask the people at the hospital, what do you think of these practices? They would probably be like, yeah, I just want to trust it. It wouldn't, it, it's, she's, a, she's a black sheep, you know? Yeah. And the reason is there's just a lot of structural and incentive, you know, problems in the healthcare space, right? And it's, and it's honestly no fault of the doctors, no fault of the servant, sure. surgeons. Like these people are at the top of their craft. I mean, maybe to your dad's point, like, you know, I'm not going to sit here and disparage, you know, a big <laughs> group of doctors. But like, you know, the reality is like, if you went to med school, you know, 40, 50 years ago, and like, you haven't been keeping up to the science with the science and, you know, things have moved so fast, like, you're going to learn more from a podcast episode than talking to one of those doctors probably for seven yeah. minutes, right? So like, um, there are some challenges, but like, I'd say by and large, like most doctors are, are, are exceptional um, and great. They're just like hamstrung by a system that isn't giving them the tools on the cutting edge or on the frontier that they need in order to like, yeah. you know, help people the way that like I needed to have been helped. It totally makes sense. I mean, yeah, if you're, if you're just absolutely printing money as a system and new tech comes, I mean, I don't even know if you would call it new tech, but let's just call it new tech comes along, right? Innovative it, it, care models. Yeah. Right. Cancer, you know, cancer patients rack up millions of dollars in bills. Um, and, and they're a sh very shitty experience of, uh, you know, having cancer, right? If a solution comes along that's cheap and it's easy and it's, you know, much more effective, they might not even, they might not even implement it because it's, it's just going to disrupt. Well, here's the problem. System. So let's take that cancer example, yeah. right? And I hope this isn't like too, you know, in the weeds of how all this healthcare stuff works. Cause I know yeah. it can get complicated if you're not, you know, that familiar with the space, but, um, again, it all comes down to incentives. So, you know, when you get cancer, you're given, you know, like all these different chemo or you're given, like you have a disease, you're given pharmaceutical drugs, right? And those are the solutions. And guess what? Why did those drugs exist? They became a thing because someone had to fund them, right? Because mm -hmm. someone could make money. So there's like an incentive problem there where like, you're only going to, you know, have solutions for things that basically can be like patentable, that, you know, can be monetized, but how the heck do you monetize an exercise routine? If like exercise plus getting sunlight plus, and this is maybe, you know, too like, like, um, you know, reductionist of an answer, but like, yeah. but just say hypothetically that a certain type of cancer, a certain type of disease was cured by diet, by exercise, grounding, by ground, you know, yeah. like by this fixing these certain nutrient deficiencies yeah. by like, you know, improving your sleep by doing all, like, say like 15 different, a stack of 15 different lifestyle factors and food factors and all these things. Um, and different nutrients or like how that's not patentable. Yeah. Right. So like, there's basically no incentive for someone to really like wrap that, you know, in a package. And, um, so th th that's just like one example, right? Like, like no academic is going to be able to, you know, turn that into like, a, I mean, maybe you could commercialize something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. But then, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, we're far away from that world. Right. Sure. We, we, we're, I think we're going to get there, but it's going to take a decade. Yeah. If not, if not more. And just a lot more. of new stuff like what you're working on. So that's, I feel like that's a great way to kind of transition into that. So you know, you go through this terrible experience and then you're introduced to a new route. You're like, wait a minute, that was completely unnecessary. Right. And, um, and there is a solution that no one or a lot of people at least didn't even know about, including yourself. Then am, am I right that you just completely are like, all right, you have this big change of heart and you're like, I want to get into health now. Right. That's a big switch, a big switch from tech and then um, social media business in LA to now health industry, but it was like a calling or? Healthcare needs new heroes. Yeah. Right. And let's just think about your average health experience. You know, you go to the doctor, it's kind of shitty. It's a shitty waiting room. You have to like physically go there, right? Like, um, again, because of the incentives in the system, your doctor might not be that knowledgeable, right? They can't even like recommend you supplements because it's not part of the protocol. Because again, these companies, you know, they can't make money off it. So there's no like pharmaceutical that, like, you know, it's just kind of terrible, mm -hmm. you know, and it's less than ideal. And like, God bless modern medicine. It does save lives, right? Like you get in a car crash and, um, you know, my brother was recently in an accident and like the, they, they got them all figured out in the ER, like the, that, you know, there are certain aspects to like, you know, modern medicine that Antibiotics, I was like, yeah, absolutely. you know, God bless, you know, yeah. like this stuff exists and like, we all probably wouldn't be here. Right. Um, 
like I don't know how many moms used to die, you know, in childbirth mm-hmm. or, you know, children used to not make it past age four. Like there's a certain like, you know, reverence that you have to pay. But the reality is there's just like certain incentives that are that are broken and um yeah, new heroes are needed. So I never want another human being to have to go through, you know, much in the same way I was thinking like no entrepreneur should have to build a company with that community. No person should ever have to go through the health challenges that that I went through or deal with anything, you know, even remotely, remotely similar. And because like, you know, healthcare experiences are less than ideal, is there a unique way basically to blend the pieces of the background that I just sort of accidentally fell into throughout life on this journey in order to create something completely new in this world, in this space, this health space that no one's ever seen. So take, you know, the idea of building community and brands and, you know, talking to people in a certain way on social media with how to build, you know, really big, scalable, powerful tech and software, and then combine that with the brains of these frontier doctors that I ended up working with, you know, to kind of heal myself on the back half, like I talked about, right, where they like look at you holistically, and they figure out the root cause of what's actually wrong. And if you combine all those things together, that's what birthed superpower. Mm. So the idea with what we're building is we're creating basically the doctor's clinic of the future. So it's all the things that you wish your doctor did, but unfortunately isn't that knowledgeable about or that equipped to be able to do. Is that yelling okay? Whatever, it's fine. Um, I just want to make sure. I mean, I tried it out for everyone watching. Like, lady comes to my house. I think it was a guy. Like, nurse comes to my house, draws my blood. Super simple, super easy. And then I didn't really like understand the whole process, but I was getting texts, you know, like this is what you have to do next and everything. And then just a couple of days ago, I get my labs back and it's just this full list of words I can't even pronounce. Um, but it says I'm optimal. And then there's a few of them lacking and, uh, and you click on the ones that you're lacking in or suboptimal, your low values. Like obviously I understand tests and everything. Um, but like, amino amino threes, right? You click on mega threes, a mega threes, right? See, I'm see it's compl- it stuff's right? complicated. But this, right? but like, see, the thing is, I don't understand that. Majority of people don't understand that. It's it's intimidating. Um, in my experience, you know, having tried it out now, is you guys have a very simple and easy way of making it less intimidating, right? So, so when you go to a traditional physical, they test like fourteen things. Yeah, it's kind of a joke, and really, all that they're measuring for is, do you have diabetes? Which is like you know, the number one killer and, you know, or like it's one of the biggest diseases and mm-hmm. costliest diseases in, in, in the world. Um, or like, are you at acute risk of death or like heart attack or stroke? Which I like, think is important, right? But like the reality is for most people, that's not, otherwise they're just like, yeah, you're good. Cool. See ya. And that's what happened to me. My entire scenario could have genuinely been a hundred percent prevented. Yeah. Connecting the dots, looking backwards, which, you know, is always easier said than done. But like, I confidently believe that there was like two tests that measured my inflammation levels um, and like some things in my gut that are like super cheap. It's like 14 bucks that would have told me and given me this indicator and like explained some of my symptoms like, Hey, something's grossly off here. And because disease doesn't just like, you know, the the things that I was dealing with, yes, maybe partly induced by potentially, you know, that this environmental trigger of the vaccine, but like the reality is like, uh, you know, disease like Crohn's or autoimmune, like I was dealing with, it doesn't just pop up overnight. There can be certain like, you know, fall over the cliff type moments where it's, you know, the point of no return, but it's a slow build, right? It's a candle burn. It's a slow burn. Like when you wake up with cancer one day, you didn't just wake up with cancer one day. For sure. You'd been nutrient deficient in some sort of pathway for like 20 years. And then your body eventually couldn't compensate anymore. And then boom, the cancer cell mutation happened. And like, it it becomes a, you know, it's like the analogy I like to think about is a cracked mirror versus a shattered mirror. Right. Like if you have a cracked mirror, you could always, you know, like seal back up the pieces and like it still works. The body can regenerate. Right. If like you catch something early. Yeah. If the mirror shatters, all of a sudden, like the glass is in a million little pieces in the ground, like that's not getting put back together. Right. The cancer spreads to too many places. Like you can't get rid of that. Like it's just it's not physically possible. Right. Um, So it's the same thing with the body. And because like your traditional primary care physical, which is, again, just by the protocol, it's what your insurance is going to cover, tests so little we're all just like completely in the dark to like what's actually happening yeah. in our body. So I'm like really, you know, it was really exciting to see your results come in and uh, yeah, I mean, you I, get this intelligence. I, I, yeah. I, I've always felt like pretty good, right? Um, but it definitely also made me feel 
um, was a lot better knowing that I that was optimal on a lot of my levels. Um, so thank you for explaining that, by the way, because I think that's awesome. I mean, I'm really excited about this. Um, it's also very affordable. I don't know how you make it so cheap, honestly, but that's awesome. I don't know if it'll stay that way, I hope. Um, <laughs> it's the power of software, man. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. now I, I kind of want to get into, um, you know, just some some questions about you as an entrepreneur. Obviously, once again, extremely successful. You're 28, right? I just turned 29. Just turned 29. Yeah. Happy birthday, by the Thanks. way. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, having built and sold multiple companies, having, um, you know, kind of been around the block, you could say, I know a lot of the people that tune into this podcast are on the younger side, right? Maybe anywhere from 18 to 26, people that are interested in entrepreneurship, um, people that are interested in just overall, like being the absolute best version of yourself. I want to ask some questions on that. So if you had to go back and start from zero, let's say money gone, um, business fell apart for the sake of the argument, let's just say like the economy absolutely cla uh, crashed and everything got taken away from you. You're back at zero. What would you do? I would do things that other people aren't doing. You know, I'd look around in my school. I'd look around in my classes. I'd look around at my friends. I'd look around at my peers and my community. And I'd say like, what is everybody not doing? Hmm. You know, because the way you break out, the way you find what you're passionate about, the way you, you don't get an edge is you do things that like are kind of like secrets still, right. Or like less discovered, you know, um, this health stuff, like now it's starting to come out, you know, but we've been building this business for about a year. So I still think we're a bit early, but like, um, and we definitely are a bit, a bit early, but I think in a decade, you know, it's going to be commonplace for everyone to get, you know, these types of tests done for everyone to have like full body intelligence all the time for everyone to be like much more health literate. But today, like that's still a challenge and it's still a problem. So like, you know, I'm doing something that like the world maybe is like just starting to wake up to. Right. So I'm kind of doing things that other people aren't doing. Yeah. Even like, you know, thinking back to, you know, like when I was a kid, like what all my other friends, they were just playing video games and, you know, hanging out with friends and, you know, fucking around and doing stupid shit. And like, I was just like researching forums and like reading things and building, Trying to learn. Bu exactly building these big yeah. spreadsheets of like, and you know, of like different things I wanted to experiment with, with my mom and like things I wanted to learn about supplements. And like, you know, I was buying supplements on Amazon and from going to vitamin shop and like learning how all the different compounds work. So like, I've been building up this health body of knowledge for years and years and years and years. Mm. And you know, that's how I like discovered Bitcoin back in the day and got in. So like, you're just curious, just curious. So it's, it's like do things that other people aren't doing, follow your curiosity. And like, that will just like inevitably find, you know, I think it'll, it'll, it'll help you find your way. Well said. I like that. And I think, um, I think, you know, it's actually funny. Jake Paul is the one I saw say this on his podcast. Like so many kids just want to get rich, right? I just want to be rich. That's why I started my first business. I want to be rich one day, but the thrill of money quickly fades and the excitement of just building something is what is what then comes. Money's an ego driver, right? Yeah. Like, um, I think the best people are, are aligned, right? Yeah. Where like, you're not just doing it for the ego and for the money. Like you're, you're, you're more calibrated and you're doing it because you love it mm -hmm. or, you know, you're doing it because the world needs it. Yep. And like, I genuinely mean that. And I say this from, you know, a place of having like the, have the privilege of building multiple businesses. And my first two, admittedly, the first business, totally admittedly, like, you know, on the record, I'll say like, I was more driven by like ego and like, I want to build a business for a business's sake. And I didn't really know why I was doing it. Right. The second business, um, you know, I, I, I didn't know if I, ha I had a purpose. Right. But, and I was like, okay, I want to help these entrepreneurs. But I also like, I didn't really honestly internalize the purpose. I was more, maybe something I just said, to be honest with you. Right. Um, cause I was maybe like trying to figure out the purpose Yeah. versus like, the third business, right? Like this is, you know, something I genuinely want to spend like decades of my life doing. Mm -hmm. I have never felt such a genuine, complete and utter alignment where the foundation of the business and the story and the mission behind it and the reasoning behind it was built on like literally something that almost killed me. Something that like, you know, I know deep down inside should, should, should not have been the way that, you know, healthcare system treated me. And I also know like what, the better side of medicine looks like, right? With like these doctors that I met who were like on the frontier, you know? And I just feel like incredibly aligned. Like I I'm, I know the mission I'm on. I'm building, I'm not just building a company, I'm fulfilling a mission, yeah. right? And, and, and I'm passionate about it, right? You're solving a huge problem. Huge and, problem. And, and 
you're already, I mean, I was going to say, if you do it, there will be a, a huge reward, but you already are. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I think that's the reward perfect. is seeing, you know, friends like you be like, wow, like I now understand myself so yeah. much deeper. And like, this has changed the lens through which I'm going to look at health throughout the rest of my life. Right. And I won't put words in your mouth, but you know, that's kind of, the, you know, the oh, dude, 100%. For. I mean, I, I, at this point in my life, and I like how you touched on this earlier, you know, trying to be, um, optimized and also trying to have balance at the same time. It's hard to, it's hard to excel in everything, right? Relationships, um, have a good time, be healthy and fit, have your business very successful. It, you, it's just really hard to balance all those. So at this point in my life, my priority is just like, how can I be as good as possible at a lot of different things um, and not ignore my health, right? So um, it, it's it's going well so far, uh, but who knows? I think I'm sure it'll get more stressful as um, as my business continues to grow. And you guys heard him say it, right? Don't do what everybody else is doing. Don't go start a clothing brand, right? I don't need any more competitors right now, <laughs> honestly. But um, sweet, that's great. I think um, I think the best question to finish it off with, because this has been super insightful for me. And once again, thank you for having me here. I like to ask this question to all of my guests I have on the podcast. Mm. What's one thing you hold to be true that almost everyone else would certainly disagree with? Hmm. Well, this might not be a common disagreement, but I think in the future it's going to flip flop and everyone's going to agree with it. Cause again, it's all about being early and doing yeah. things that other, but I genuinely think we're all getting poisoned. Hmm. Not to end on like a dark note, but like, yeah. like seriously sick is the new normal. And like the food we're eating is, is, is really not that great for us. It's devoid of nutrients and like the average person uses like hundreds of personal care products a day that all have like different chemicals in them that are like affecting, you know, our hormones and our bodies. And like, you know, we see this in all the tests that we run with the, you know, like people are, are sicker than they realize. Yeah. And you know, like we all walk around feeling a little tired. Something's wrong. So like, I, I just see it, you know, I see it on people's faces. I see it on friends' faces. I, 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 we see it in the data. And, um, I just don't think people realize like, you know, how suboptimal, they are because they never felt like what it feels like to be the most amazing, you know, vibrant version of, of themselves. And again, that's why I'm on this mission, right? Like I, cause I see this super clearly and I don't want it to be that way and it shouldn't be that way. And like humanity deserves better. We all deserve better. You know, we all deserve to feel our best and, you know, you can only go out in the world and like build amazing companies or push the world forward. If your foundation is solid and like you're the healthiest, you know, happiest, most content and inspired version of yourself. So that's that's what we're working towards. Hell yeah. Well, dude, I love that. And I admire you and I applaud you. And I um it's already going really well, but I know it's gonna I know it's gonna not even not even slowly, but like quickly start to take over. So I appreciate what you're doing. Um and I appreciate you giving Lucas, me a test for free. Appreciate you. So yeah. thanks for uh, thanks for coming on, man. And Jacob Peters, superpower, check out his stuff. Um absolutely incredible individual. Thanks for having me over, man. Cool. Appreciate you.